1 Corinthians chapter number 12, and we're just going to read um, three verses tonight, starting in verse number 12. It says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. But for the body is not one member, but many. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for this day, Lord. We thank you again. Uh, Lord, as Brother Peter alluded to, just thank you, Lord, for having a midweek service. Thank you for us having a church that have people have a desire to come out and hear your word preached. Lord, we can continue to have a midweek service. Lord, we just thank you for that. We do thank you for all the visitors that are here. Lord, we just ask you to continue to touch our pastor and help him. We just ask even tonight, Lord, you just continue to help Brother Bobby Cato and give him the message we need for the weekend. Lord, and you just help me now with what you've laid upon my heart to preach. Lord, uh, help me give it to your people the same way you gave it to me. Lord, ask that uh, not say anything contrary to your word and just help me hide me behind the cross, Lord, and use uh, your message tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing I want to look at is we see it talks about here uh, in verse number 12, for as the body is one and hath many members. So we see the multiple people that it talks about. We can obviously look around in here tonight and see multiple people. Uh, you know, we was, uh, I was talking with somebody as we, as we were standing back at the back door tonight, and we've seen a lot of visitors come in. And if you think back to preaching a couple Sunday mornings ago, we had a lot of people out traveling then uh, when I was preaching, and you think, hey, I'm not going to have many people here. You know, you might not get as nervous. And that morning, we had 25 visitors, I think it was. So, but, but regardless of who's here, we have multiple people, and whoever here is exactly who uh, God needs to be here. We see the multiple people. We also see the multiple backgrounds. It talks about being Jews or Gentiles. You think about how all of us come from someplace different. And it's not just different parts of the, uh, of the, of the world, just different parts in, in our lives and the way we've grown up. And some may have come from uh, broken homes or some may have come from Christian homes. Some may have come from, uh, you know, who knows what. But we all have different multiple backgrounds that we all have. And each of us in here, if we look up in verses 4 through 6, we also see that not only do we have multiple people here from multiple backgrounds, we see that we all have different gifts. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrators, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh in all. So we see we all have different gifts. We all have something to offer tonight. Whether it was to sing, whether it was to shake hands when you came in the door, whether it... Uh, you, whether it be to, to teach or whether it just be to uh, play the piano, sing, whatever. But we all have something that we can offer the Lord tonight. We all have something that we can offer each other tonight. Do we make use of those things? And we'll get to that here in a little bit. But we see that also in verse number 6. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which works in all. We all have multiple personalities. Brother Jordan talked about, you know, picking on Sister uh, Sheila, talking about he's the son of the pastor and that's why he's that way. Well, I'm that way too, I think, just because I've been here so long, you take after. You know, I would have said the same thing to her. But we still all have different personalities. That's why we all fit together. If we was all like Brother Phil, it'd be crazy. If we was all quiet like Brother Clint, you'd think we had a dead church. You know, we all have different personalities, but the main thing of all this that it talks about is Christ. The main one. So we're all in Christ. We're all fitly framed together in Christ. God led each and every one of us here through whatever means that it needed to be here. Whether it was a church split, whether you drove down the street and just seen our church and visited. Whatever the reason may be, but we're all here. The problem is too many times, that's exactly it. We're all here. What are we out there? See, we come in here and we have a good time and we praise God and we sing and we listen to preaching. But when we get out there, what are we? What does the, do we truly want to be a lighthouse to the community? It becomes very easy to come and sit at church and just go through the motions. You know, I figure up, if, and look, if this is you, I'm not saying this to pick on anybody, but if you're that person that maybe, you know, the last one to walk in the door and the first one to leave, there's a pretty good chance that you spend twice as much time one day at work as what you do all week in church. If you come in at the last minute, you know, you might be here for three hours on Sunday, maybe four, depending on what time you get here, in an hour, hour and a half or so, maybe on, on Wednesday nights. Especially Brother Josh preaching. You know, you ain't going to be here long, right? But regardless of what time we get here, 
you'll still spend more time in one day at work than what you will in the house of God in a week. So we should have a bigger effect outside of there than what we do in here. We absolutely have different things that we can do, and, and all these things are good. But what, is the, what does the community see? And that's what I want to preach with this thought in mind tonight. Does the world see any church in you? When you go out into the world, when you spend the majority of your time out in the world during your week, does the world see any church in you? And you think about the different things that we have to go on inside the church. And we, we had Sister Barb get up and sing, and we had other people that could sing. Do they see a singer? Now, you automatically think, if you're like me, you know, Psalm 69 and verse 30, I will praise the name of the God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. You automatically think, I can't sing. I ain't going to sing out in front of anybody. No, but what? in Psalms 40 and verse 3, he says, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. It's not that we just uh, we go out sing, but it's about our attitude. See, when we have a song in our hearts and we know what God's done for us, we have a different attitude that people see. We, when people see us coming, they don't see that. And I really didn't mean to do that, but I, I just, I, as I was making the turn, there sat Brother Randy up there as he leaned back. So it just worked out good. But that's what the world sees. When, if, if you have a coworker standing at the end of a hallway or something like that and you, at, at your work, and they see you coming down the hall, what's their first thought? Oh, here comes Brother Josh. I'm going to turn around and get out of here because I don't need to be miserable with him. All right, here comes Eeyore. I don't need to be miserable with him today. Or can they not wait to see you because they know you just, you're just that happy person. You're just that positive person. You're just that person that they, they want to see each day. Because we have that song in our heart. We have that song in our mouth. And we, we have that praise that's easy on the tip of our tongue. We realize God's good. He's wonderful. You know, we get so... and, and I, You know... There are certain things that happen to you that you don't know why, and I don't know why this happened last night, but I'm going to put it right here. Last night, we sat and we're playing games at home, and we get up, and, and I just put a load of, of laundry in the washing machine to turn on, and, and we get upstairs, and we're, everybody's getting ready to go to bed, and all of a sudden, we get an alert. The alarm went off. Water detected in the basement. That was what I said. Oh, no. Well, the thing about where the water was detected in the basement, Sister Tina just bought a new sensor and put down there about a month ago, right next to the hot water heater. So I head down to the basement, I get to the bottom of the steps, and I can already hear water dripping. I'm like, oh, no. I get downstairs, and it's just pouring from the ceiling. I said, turn the washing machine off. We've been there 17 and a half years. I have no idea why it happened now. But for whatever reason, the drain hose of the washer popped out of the little drain thing and was just all over in the floor. But thankfully, praise God, we had a sensor. Instead of it running the whole load of laundry and nobody finding it until I got up at 5 o'clock this morning to go to work, we found it last night, dried everything up, didn't hurt a thing. And see, it's those kinds of things that when we look at in our life and know what God's done for us, we have that praise on our lips and we have that people look at us and think, you're just different. People should look at us and, and see that we're different. When was the last time you had somebody ask you that question? Do you go to church? Are you a preacher? Do you go to church? There's just something different about you. You're not like the world. Why? Because we have that attitude in our heart, and it shows out when people sing it, when people see us. If we have that song in our heart, we have that song on our mouth and that praise. The second thing that we can, that do people see outside of the world is a servant's heart. In Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 6, it says, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. We talked about a little bit, you know, what is the aura we get off? Do we give off that one of a servant or that one of an attention seeker? Do we give off that one that we just have that, that we're willing to serve others and we're willing to help others when needed, and we'll get to that in a little bit, or do we give off of that person that's just an attention seeker? You know, we, 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 and look, I have social media, we all have cell phones, you know, but we've get, reached that place in the world that we're all out looking for attention. We'll post anything to get attention, anything to make people look at us instead of being a servant. We should have a servant's heart. That's what, I, it's not about stepping up for anything else other than just wanting to serve God. I know what he's done in my life. I know how he's helped me. And therefore, when I look at others out in the world, I know what he can do for them in their struggles, when the things that they're going through. So we should have to, to want to see that, you know, let people know this is what I do this for God because how he's helped me. And he'd do the same thing for you. He can help you. And they should see 
that servant's heart. The third thing, and I promise, stay with me, don't get discouraged here. Do they see a supplier or a cheerful giver? In 2 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart to let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, I'm not talking about money and just going out and giving all of our money away, okay? I'm not talking about that. But what about just our time? What about just a shoulder to somebody? What about, what about just a listening ear? Do we willingly go out of our way to let people know, I'm here for you? You know, it's easy. That's the one thing that I hate anymore. Uh, you know, I, I love to text, and it's easy to text. You don't have to have people to talk, you know. But it, it becomes very discouraging at times when you send people a text message, and you can send somebody a text, hey, I'm praying for you, I'm here for you. And if you're sometime, you can be that cynical, I can be that cynical person. They don't mean that. They're just doing that because it's, it's the right thing to do, you know. It's the right thing to do to let somebody know that. But do we truly go out of our way to let people know? You know, I, I've used an example before of thanking somebody for something. You know, somebody gives you $10. There's a big difference between just extending a hand and saying thank you or truly you have no idea what this $10 meant to me. You, have, you know, this is the only way I'm going to eat today or whatever it may be. Do we go out of our way to others, let others know we're there for them? I'm praying for you. I, you know, any time that we see somebody we think going through something just to let them know, hey, just want to let you know I'm praying. Don't know what you're going through. You just seemed upset. You seemed mad. You seem like having a bad day. Just want to let you know that I'm there. And being that person that they, that they truly know, hey, they're praying for me. They really care. And really showing the world that people care because that's what the world needs. It, it's, it's had enough of itself, so to speak. It's had enough of, of everybody that will let it down. It needs those people who truly are worried and concerned about their well-being and are truly worried and concerned about the things they're going through and the people that when we tell them we're going to pray for them, we're willing to pray for them. When we tell them, hey, listen, if you need something, call, talk, text, whatever it may be, and willing to pick up the phone when they call. You know, that's one of the things I ask all those people when we go to jail on Sunday mornings. I said, how many, you know, I don't want you to come to our church just to come to church. I want you to come to church so you can be surrounded by God's people. You can be surrounded by people that care for you. Because you've been surrounded by so many people. I ask them, I say, how many of those people of your so-called friends, if you go pick up the phone right now, will talk to you? I'm not talking about coming and bailing you out. I'm not talking about giving you money. We'll just be willing to talk and listen. That's what we love about our church. We have a church full of people that I know that if you had something going on, if they're not at work and they can physically talk to you, they would talk to you. They would be there for you. They'll text you at any time. That's what we should be. That's what we should be outside these walls for others. You know, I know Sister Kathy has given prayer requests so many times, and I don't know how many times I've heard her say, her co-workers come up, I know you have a praying church. This is my prayer request. And I've heard others say it too. Do we all give off that aura? Do we all give that off? Do all those people that we work around, do they see enough church in us to know, you got to pray in church. You're somebody that can get hold of God for me. Can you pray for me? Can you do this? Can, 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 I need somebody to talk to. I don't understand this or whatever. We should be and have and give off Amen. and be that cheerful giver to them with our time and a listening ear and a shoulder and those kind of things. The fourth thing, I have notes in here that... Miss Tina told me to get to slow down, but we're still going pretty quick. The fourth thing, do they see a scholar? Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Not about taking the Bible and just teaching them and trying to knock people upside the head. What does your life teach others? What is the way you live your life outside of these walls in the world? Teach others. It's easy to pick up a Bible and tell somebody, you need to be at church. You need to be saved. You need to do this. You need to do that. What do we show them with how we live? When they look at us, what, what kind of church do we give off, so to speak, for them? Can they look at us and know something different? Or do they look at us and think, you're just like me? Look, I've heard Brother Doug, I've heard Brother Doug share this many times. When he used to be a pastor somewhere else, and he would talk about Brother Ray, and they would go out on visitation, and they said they would knock on people's doors, and what would they ask Brother Ray? Is so-and-so family, whoever it is, they still go down there? If they still go there, I'm good. And I don't know the situation, but too many times that's the kind of life we give off. Sure. 
well, if so-and-so is going to church, and if they say they're going to heaven, I'm good because I know how they live. What do we teach others with our life? Not just picking up a book and saying something. What do we teach them with our life? What are we showing them out there? We say and we pray that we want to be a lighthouse of this community. Are we? Plain and simple, are we? God gives us everything to be that. But are we? Do they look at us and see something different? Do they look at us and see their need for Christ? Do they look at us and know they're not like the big whatever churches? They're not like this. They're not like there's something different in that person. They don't fall apart every time something goes wrong. They don't change with every season. They don't do those things. There is something different about them. Are we that person that is a scholar or a teacher? And the last thing before I get into the bad stuff does the world see in you a shepherd? Great leaders should come from the church. Look, I understand completely, I'm not very old, I understand completely that I could be way off base. But I have to wonder, what kind of shape would our country be in today if us as Christians would be willing to take a stand? Plain and simple. Where would we be if we would be willing to take a stand? Because, see, too many times, we'll get into the bad stuff a little bit, that it's just little things that we're not willing to stand up and lead. We're not willing to step up and say, no, it stops here. Our pastor preached about a couple Wednesday nights ago, and he talked about um, uh, somebody acting different and, and those kind of things, and he talked about different stuff. Boy, it's really odd to see me walk off the, off the stage, isn't it? You know, at times, we get you, if you're that person... Hey, Brother Donald, you know, I think we should be doing this instead. What do, you, what do you think? You know, we need to have people with the backbone to say, let's go talk to the pastor. What's the pastor say about that? Instead of trying to back channel our way through things, and it goes the same thing with the things that go on in this world. We should be able to teach and lead the world different than what they seem to be walking in. We should be willing to take a stand and say, no, that ain't right. It's not about me offending you or me offending somebody else. That's just not right. It goes against everything that God wants. It goes against everything that has ever been, and we're not going to stand for it. But too many times, we just step back and we allow ourselves to be walked on. What kind of a great leader? When you, you think of uh, a great leader, whatever happened to the fact of being able to trust somebody... If, if I tell, uh, I, I bought my first car this way many, many years ago. I'm going to buy that car from you for $900. We good? I'll pay you back. Absolutely. That was it. Fifth, four, I just barely turned 15 years old. I got a job working at McDonald's. Mom said, if you're going to work at McDonald's, you're going to have to buy a car to just drive you back and forth in. So I bought a car. That was how I bought it. Handshake. Amen. We wouldn't dare do that nowadays. We wouldn't trust somebody as far as they throw them. And unfortunately, there's some of us that could be a church that that person wouldn't trust us as far as they could throw them. Amen. What kind of leader are we? What kind of example are we setting? Are we a scholar? Are we a leader? Are we a true leader in the community? That it, it doesn't have to be getting in politics and being the next senator, just in our community. What kind of leaders do we have? Amen. Politics aren't corrupt because we had good Christian leaders in there. They're corrupt because too many people get in there that they're just corrupt. What if, what if we were the ones that started to say, no, we need to set better examples. We need to be better scholars. We need to be better teachers. We need to do a better job in teaching the world right and wrong. Now, it doesn't have to be a gray area, just right and wrong. We need to do a better job of being leaders. What kind of church are we? Unfortunately... Too many times we fall in line with this. And I understand completely that, that this is the Wednesday night crowd. You know, I don't want to sound mean or rude, take it up with God. This is what God gave me, so this is what we're going to get. Too many times we're more in line as a busybody. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 13, And with all they learned to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. Too many times we can't wait to spread stuff. 
We can't wait to gossip about stuff. We'll have somebody that will that will uh, somebody that will be willing to share something with us. And, and and Brother Clint's called me, and Brother Clint's got something he's telling me, and I'm talking to him on the phone. Where's my phone at? I'm talking to him on the phone, and he says, Brother Josh, I'm really struggling with this. Can you pray for me? Absolutely, Brother Clint. And before I hang up, I'm already texting Brother Donald. You're not going to guess what Brother Clint's going through. What kind of person's that? You have people that you go to work with that are lost people that don't go to church and they share something with you and they share something with you in confidence and the first thing you do is go run and tell the next co-worker. Well, why is, why is Brother Jordan looking at me different now? Oh, because he knows all my business because Brother James went and told him everything that I told him. That's all. We, we have too much time where we're so interested in gossiping. We're so interested in knowing everything that's going on about everybody. We seem to think that we have to know everything that's going on. No, we don't. We need to know what God wants for us. That's all we need to know. You know, it all started when we all thought it was cool and people, I never did this. I have social media, but I never did it. I'm not going to tell you everything I'm having for breakfast and everything I had for lunch and everything I'm doing every minute of every day. It, it's, it's, you know, but that's, and that has caused us to think we have to know everybody's business. You know, we'll, we'll stand around and it goes on in church. You, you'll see somebody standing by talking and somebody else just standing beside you. See how close I can get so I can listen. See what they're saying. Hey, are you believing? Now, I don't know what he was talking about. This is what it sounded like, what he said. What's that all about? What kind, what kind of example are we setting? And we wonder why we don't get more people in church. Amen. Not only are we too busy being a busybody and gossiper, we're too busy backbiting. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse 20. For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you as such as I would and, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wrath, strife, backbitings, whispering, swellings, tumults. We're all ready just to, we're all just ready to, to get back at anybody that we can. Stick that knife in, twist it however we want, and do anything we want to do just to get somebody back. But we perceive maybe as they've done something wrong. Or just because we just think that's what they need, that's what they deserve in our mind. We're too busy too many times backbiting. We're too busy sometimes trying to get ourselves someplace uh, by, by destroying somebody else. You know, I preached on uh, a Sunday at, at jail talking about, you know, one of the things talk about, it's easy for us to look and judge others instead of looking at ourselves. And it's easy for us to compare ourselves and we'll want to backbite and, and tear other people down because it, it makes us feel good about ourselves. I don't want to get into the Bible and compare myself to Christ. Because I'm going to see where I fall short. But if I can pick somebody that's not here on Wednesday night, or I can pick somebody that's not here on Sunday night, or somebody that's not faithful to do anything around church, that makes it easier. And we'll talk about them. We'll backbite. We'll, we'll, we'll you know, gnash on them with teeth almost, so to speak, trying to tear them down and, and do anything we can to get back at them. What kind of person is that? What are we teaching the world? We go to work and we talk about people and things like that. Why, why are they then going to want to have anything or do anything with us when it comes to church? When they see that, when they see us backbiting and those kinds of things. And lastly, and this is the last thing, do we give off any of those positive things? Are we too busy being a busybody? Are we too busy being a backbiter? Or are we too busy being a backslider? In Proverbs 14, 14, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself too many times that's where we're at we're satisfied they don't see that fire it's not just about backsliding and, and our our neighbors or our friends or things like that it's not even just about them boy you used to go to church this many times a week now i only see you go sunday morning it's about everything the way that they see the way we used to be well, I used to see you pack your Bible out. I used to see you uh, maybe go out on visitation. You used to invite me to church every now and then. Now you never mention it. Why? Why not? Have we become too satisfied and we've backslid on God? You know, it's not even backslidden to the back row. It's just where we've gotten satisfied and those things just aren't as urgent or as important to us as they used to be. It is still a lost and dying world. We still have thousands and thousands and thousands of vehicles that travel up and down Pleasant Valley Road that do not go to church anywhere. 
I told you, it, it absolutely blew my mind one of the first times that I went to jail on a Sunday morning. And we used to get our chicken from Kroger, and one of the first couple Sundays that I went over there, when you go pick up the chicken, you walk into Kroger and you can't even check out. And I'm like, what in the world? Does nobody else go to church besides us? And you come on and you have, and this is, look, I'm, I'm, I promise I'm not being mean, Miss Mary. It amazes me. You'll come out of jail on Sunday. We're fixing to hit. It's about to be warm weather, and I know they're going to have them. And if you go over there, God bless you, have at it. But it amazes me the thousands of people that show up on that fairground to buy other people's junks. Junk. They call them antiques. You call it whatever you want. But you will not almost be able to drive out through there. It'll be so packed. There'll be a steady stream of traffic in there that fairgrounds. Amen. Then there are all those people. What, what are we putting off in our life to make them see the need to come to church? What, I mean, what are we doing to make them see their need to come to church? Because if we were doing what we needed to do, they would at least maybe give it a second thought. Maybe not every Sunday that they have that, it wouldn't be full. But too many times it's because we've just backslidden away from God. We've just gotten satisfied. And we've gotten satisfied to the point that we just don't give it the same thought that we used to. Well, I've invited my neighbors. I've invited my brothers and sisters. I've invited my family 50 times. They're just not going to come. I've had that attitude before. Anybody else? What's wrong with 51? You know how many times I sat in a service lost? I'm glad God didn't say, well, that's enough. I'm done with you too. See, it's not for us to decide when to stop. It's not for us to decide, well, I'm just, I'm just going to sit back here and relax and God will take care of it. God will work things out. No, it's not for us to decide. Allow God to tell you. If God tells you to quit, Brother Mike talked about it. He talked about it on uh, Sunday. Told about some fellow asked him, when's it time to retire? And he said, I don't know, go ask my dad, who had been preaching whatever it was, 50-some years back. He goes, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll let you know if God ever tells me to. See, but we just become so used to, this, to the norm. We come in on Sunday morning, we come in on Sunday night, we go back home, we come in on Wednesday maybe, and we go back home, we just become satisfied, and we just backslide on God a little bit. We don't read the way we used to, we don't pray the way we used to, we don't have that song in our heart the way we used to, we don't go out in the world. You know, we should, we should I have, was asked this at work the other day, I walked into one of the buildings that I was working in, and somebody said, what's wrong with you today? Nothing. You just you seem like you're down. Like, no, I'm good. My bad. Wasn't paying attention. But you know, that, that should be how we are. They, sh they should look at us and know we should give off that aura and have that smile on our face and give off that, man, you're always in such a good mood and you're always just seem to be positive. Why? Let me tell you what God's done for me. But see, we allow ourselves to get satisfied and we allow ourselves to backslide and people look at our life and they don't see a need. They don't see the need to come to church. They don't see the need to get saved. They don't see their need for anything else in their life because they look at our life and think, you're no different than me. You'll call me and tell me all the latest gossip before I ever chance to call you. You'll call me talking about somebody else. You know what's the old saying talking about? You, you, they have the preacher every Sunday afternoon for lunch. You know, you're sitting at the sitting at, at wherever you go to eat at and you're talking about the preacher. Why is the person next to you that didn't go to church that morning, why are they going to want to go the way you're talking about him? You know? Where do we fall? Hopefully you fall in one of these first five. Hopefully you fall in one of those first five. But I'm afraid too many times we fall in the last three because we become satisfied. We get to that point where we just get comfortable where we're at. And you know the one thing that I have, that I have learned and I have found over time in trying to allow God to speak to me and study and prepare messages and devotions and things like that? You have all the time that you need for whatever it is that you want to put that time into. You can say all you want. Oh, I don't have time to read anymore. I don't have time to be more involved in church. No, you have time. You just choose not to be. You will make time for certain things. I have learned that. You, whether it comes to spending time in thought and meditation, driving back and forth to work, spending your 15-minute break at work, studying or reading or doing whatever, you will find time for what you want to find time for. And when we get to the point where we find the time if we want to put into the things of God, we'll be that lighthouse for the community. We'll see the community change. We'll see the community turned upside down. You know, it can be something as simple 
Brother Ray, share with me tonight. It's going to take five months. Is that what you said? Five months for that sign. Five months to replace that sign. Because they have to send letters or send whatever and invite everybody on Pleasant Valley Road to come to say if they're going to be against that sign or whatever. Five months. There's a whole lot that can happen if we just become busybodies and backbiters and backslidden to where they can say, nah, we didn't gonna let you put up a sign to be able to put scripture on anymore. We'll take that one out and you'll be done. But see, if we want to be that lighthouse, we need to make sure we're doing what God wants us to do. And then God will take care of everything else. God might even come back and you, who knows what, kind of what might happen. But God will take care of things if we're where we need to be. What does the world see in you? When you go outside of here tomorrow, what is going to, what does everybody look at you and see? They say, well, you went to church last night, didn't you? Are you that excited? Look, if you know me, and I don't know why I always come back to this, if you know me, you know how much I love golf. The greatest week of the year, bar none, this week. I'll argue that up and down. You can take your NCAA tournament, you can take anything. The Masters starts tomorrow. Am I more excited about that or the fact that we got to come to church tonight? What have I spent more time at work talking about this week? What God did for us on Sunday or an upcoming stupid golf tournament? What about us? What have we spent more time talking about to our neighbors, to our coworkers? We spent more time talking about, boy, summertime's coming up and I can't wait to, to go to the pool and I can't wait to go out and get my new bass boat out and go fishing. Boy, I can't wait to go uh, do this in the yard. I can't wait to go yard sailing. I can't wait to go do this. I can't wait for vacation. Or are we talking about the things of God? Well, let me tell you what God did for us. Let me tell you about what well, we had a preacher this past week that was just diagnosed with Parkinson's and he just had a stroke and he still was able and God's touched him and he stood and preached the word of God to us this past Sunday. What are we more excited about? What does the world see in you? I'm finished, Brother Jordan.